Hi class, this is the beginning of unit six. This is going to be the unit where the drama really starts to pick up. Uh, we're gonna start with the war and we're gonna end with the war. So uh, in unit six, we're gonna start off with the causes of the Mexican-American War and the war itself. And we will end this unit uh, with the beginning of the American Civil War, which has been the focal point of most of this class. Uh, keep in mind that the results of the Mexican-American War are going to be ultimately negative for the country because it brings in new land. We don't know what to do with it as a nation, if we're going to make free states or slave states out of it. So really, the Mexican-American War is going to put us on the road to the Civil War. <clears throat> uh, so there you see the central idea. Uh, there's going to be an idea that takes hold, that gets popularized in the United States. Uh, it's called Manifest Destiny. I'll explain more on that in a moment, but basically it's going to be a major motivating factor in us moving out west as a nation and we're going to have a desire for more land out west and that is going to ultimately lead to tension with other countries that are already occupying that land for example we're going to want to have the Oregon country which we were sharing with with England and we're not going to be willing to share it with them any longer uh, and that could have become a war with England a third war with England and then also we will end up moving to the southwest, and that will end up causing tension with Mexico. Uh, and eventually we'll have the Mexican-American War, in which we basically take the northern half of Mexico uh, from that country. So I'll get more into detail uh, on that when we get to the war itself. Okay, first let's talk about Manifest Destiny. If you look at the painting here, you can see a depiction of, the, uh, of Manifest Destiny. You can see this idea that the United States is bringing light or civilization or something like that to the West. Uh, Manifest Destiny itself was this idea that Americans held on to that not only did we have a right to take land out West, uh, we basically had a God-given mandate to do so. It was with God's permission, with God's blessing that we were doing this. So you kind of see a merging of, of religion and nationalism here in our desire to move out west. And this really cranks up after the War of 1812 during the era of good feelings. You start seeing people wanting to move out west. And this is going to pick up more and more as time goes on. In fact, we're moving out west, uh, but we don't call it Manifest Destiny until 1846, which is the year that uh, of the Mexican-American War. So <clears throat> we had uh, already kind of embrace this idea and then in right around the time of the Mexican-American War we're given a name and that name again is Manifest Destiny. So there's this idea that God had wanted Americans to go and, and conquer the West. If there were people there that were in our way, well God was on our side. If it caused any fighting with Native Americans, God would be on our side. If it caused a war with Mexico, God would be on our side. And, and, and the idea again was that we were bringing our ways, which we consider to be superior, our culture, which we consider to be superior to other people. So if you look at this painting, you can see that there's this idea almost of a divine being moving out west, and you see that we are bringing light to the darkness, which is on the outskirts of this, this picture. And even though Manifest Destiny was a popular idea, it's also going to be a divisive idea because as you look in the notes, it says this is, is going to encourage people to move out west before the Civil War, uh, but also during and after. Uh, it leads to the Civil War. Basically, whenever we move out west and so we start taking in this, these new pieces of land, one of the pro problems with Manifest Destiny is that we can't decide as a nation what we want to do with this new land that we bring in. We can't decide if we want to be free or if we want to be slave. We try to engineer another compromise. Henry Clay is going to show up again eventually. Uh, but in the end, this it cannot be solved without a civil war. Now, once the civil war is over, Manifest Destiny is going to pick up and accelerate, and we're really going to start to move out west in, in, in big numbers. Uh, and that's an idea that you're going to hear a lot more about in American history, too, is the settling of the West after the Civil War. Keep in mind that, again, Manifest Destiny is going to create more tension uh, over slavery within our country, but it's also going to cause tension with other countries when we start to try to claim land that is already claimed by these other countries. <clears throat> Now, this is uh, in the day before you had major railroads that took people out west. Uh, you did have uh, railroads in existence by this point, 
but there was no transcontinental railroad. In other words, there was no railroad that went all the way across the country. So if you look at this map here, you can see that when people moved out west before the Civil War, they basically had to take trails. There were established routes. They usually would follow along rivers as much as they could. When they got to the Rocky Mountains, they'd try to find a low point in the mountains right here where I'm pointing with a mouse. That's what where South Pass is, a very low point in the Rockies. Uh, and it was actually a very dangerous uh, route to take. If you got caught in the mountains during the winter, you were likely to die, uh, probably of starvation. Some of you may have heard of the Donner Party. The Donner Party was caught in the mountains of eastern California, and they were the ones that famously had to resort to cannibalism. So this, this uh, going out west before the Civil War, before there were major railroads built to take people out west, uh, it was a very dangerous thing, and you had to time it just right. But people still did so for new opportunity. You saw people moving out west for religious freedom, for example, the Mormons. You saw people moving out west for gold. We'll get to the California gold rush in this unit. You saw people moving out west for, for ranching to become ranchers, or you saw people moving out west to become farmers. Uh, <clears throat> and that gets talked more about uh, after the Civil War. But even before the Civil War, you do see people moving out west, usually in wagons, uh, because there was no transcontinental railroad built all the way across the country. Now, why was there no transcontinental railroad built? Because the North wanted one built across the northern half of the West, and the South wanted to have a railroad built along the southern half of the West, and I'll get more into that later on in this unit. The fight over the transcontinental railroad was also related to the fight over slavery in the West. More on that later. There you see a picture of one of the wagon trains. That's how people would have moved out west. And I kind of got ahead of myself, which is typical. Uh, so why did people move out west? Well, one reason would be for economic reasons, to make a living in railroad building eventually, not yet. But they definitely were, before the Civil War, moving out west for opportunities in mining. The California gold rush is going to happen right after the Mexican-American War, for example. People moved out west to raise cattle. That would be ranching. That's the era of the cowboy. That really picks up after the Civil War. But most people went out west to homestead, which basically means to become farmers, which was very difficult to do out in the, in the Great Plains because the environment was not that conducive to farming. It didn't rain very much. It was very dry, and the soil was not that fertile, but people still tried. Uh, other people moved out west in order uh, ahead of these this uh, group that I'm talking about already. Uh, Earlier in American history, you had these so-called mountain men that would move out west, and they would intentionally live in the mountain areas because there were a lot of animals in the mountain areas. Uh, the beaver was almost hunted to extinction whenever beaver caps uh, or hats were popular. They would hunt for bear. They would hunt for foxes. They would hunt for different kinds of animals that they could get fur from, and then they would sell these furs. Well, eventually... Clothing styles changed. People didn't want to wear furs anymore, and all of a sudden these mountain men looked like they were going to be out of a job. Luckily for them, because they had been out west longer than most people, they could basically serve as guides to the people that were wanting to take those trails I just showed you. The people that wanted to go out west to become miners or ranchers or farmers, they could go to the mountain men who had already been out there uh, for a long time and get directions and know the best route to get to where they wanted to be. In fact, the Donner Party that I referred to before, they actually got some bad advice, if I remember correctly, and they were told to take a shortcut, which ended up not being such a shortcut, and that's why they got stuck in the mountains. Anyway, so uh, before people started moving out west for mining, ranching, and farming, you already had people that had moved out there for fur trapping, uh, and then when the fur trapping industry started to die, these mountain men served as guides to those that were moving out west during the time of Manifest Destiny, uh, the... Uh, the overlanders is what they were called. Another reason that people moved out west was for religious freedom. The Mormons, as I said before in the earlier unit, uh, they were persecuted in New York. They were persecuted in Illinois. After Joseph Smith died, Brigham Young led them out west uh, to escape religious persecution. They moved to what is now Utah and uh, established what they thought was going to be their own country called Deseret, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, eventually, though, that land is going to be taken in by the United States after the Mexican-American War, and eventually Utah becomes a state of the United States, and that happens after the Civil War.
if you look at this uh, slide, you can see I forgot to change the, the, the slide to where the bullets come up one at a time. So all three are up at once, but I'll go through them one at a time. So one thing to note is that over time, settlers are going to do a lot of damage to the environment. They're not going to do a lot of damage early on because there's just not that many people moving out west. Once the trains are uh, bringing people out west, once transcontinental railroads are built after the Civil War, you'll see the population out west increase dramatically, and you'll see environmental damage also increase dramatically. We almost hunted the American bison to extinction, for example. Another problem that you'll see on the frontier that's not as big of a deal right now, but will be a bigger deal after the Civil War, is the conflict with the Native Americans. Now remember, the Native Americans had been sent out west. Some of them already lived out there, but many of them had been forced to live out there after the uh, Indian Removal Act of 1830 and after uh, the Trail of Tears had occurred. So you have a concentrated population of Native Americans out west at this point, and Americans are about to move out there for mining, ranching, and farming. And as that population increases, so does the conflict with the Native Americans. Ultimately, there's no more place to push Native Americans to. We can't keep pushing them westward because we're moving westward. We can't just push them into the Pacific Ocean. So what we're going to end up doing is putting them in the pieces of land that we desire the least, which would be the uh, reservations. And the reservation system uh, really picks up after the Civil War. Also, settlers are going to struggle when they're out west, and now I'm on the third bullet. Uh, so when settlers moved out west, they had to deal with lots of psychological problems uh, because they were lonely. They lived very far away from the rest of civilization. They had their family, and that was about it, usually, uh, at least if you're a homesteader or a farmer. Uh, they also had to deal with the isolation, the, the loneliness. The environment is very tough, especially on the Great Plains. For example, the winters can be consistently uh, the temperature will be below freezing in the summertime it can be 100 degrees uh, tornado alley if you know what I'm referring to there the, the, the storms can be very brutal so they had to deal with a very rugged environment and of course uh, there was always the possibility of Native American attacks here is a picture of some people that moved out west probably to be farmers and uh, you can see they're living in a house that is literally built out of bricks of sod, so basically a dirt house that's loosely held together with wood, and you can imagine what life is like for them. But when people want new opportunity, they'll try just about anything. Okay, now let's get into politics. Let's get into a North Carolina president. Uh, let's talk about James K. Polk. So the election of 1844 is one of the major uh, elections in American history, in early American history. This is going to be the election that decides whether or not our nation is going to go on the course of manifest destiny or continue on that course or not. And remember that the last unit we left off, Texas had just become independent from Mexico, and there was this lingering question of whether or not the United States was going to annex the Republic of Texas. So we're at 1844. Texas has been independent for nearly a decade, and we still have not made a final decision on what to do with Texas. So in the election of 1844, James Knox Polk is going to run against Henry Clay. Polk is from the Charlotte, North Carolina area, uh, and he is going to be a president that's only going to serve one term, but that's because that's all he wanted to serve. He is going to be aggressive. They called him Young Hickory. They saw him as another Andrew Jackson type. He was very uh, no-nonsense. He was known to be a workaholic, and he uh, is going to be very vocal about expanding our country. Other politicians, like Henry Clay, kind of danced around the issue of, of expansion, especially when it came to Texas, and that actually cost Henry Clay the election. So think about today, think about politicians today. Some people get annoyed with politicians that seem to dance around issues and not take a solid stand on things. Some people are attracted to politicians that do take a solid stand on issues. Well, Polk is going to take a solid stance when it comes to Manifest Destiny. So his platform is that he is going to be very committed to the idea of Manifest Destiny. He's going to be very committed to the idea of expanding westward. Now, what does that specifically mean? Uh, well, whenever he's campaigning, he says, we are going to expand. How are we going to expand? Well, one of the things he says is, we will annex Texas. It will become eventually a state in the United States. And this is going to be alarming to a lot of northern abolitionists, because a lot of northern abolitionists knew 
very well that Texas was a slaveholding country and that if it became a state, it would be a slaveholding state. It would give more power in Congress to the slaveholding states. So the very uh, the abolitionists that were in the North, the anti-slavery people that were in the North, the people that didn't want slavery to expand westward, they're going to be pretty upset with the idea of, of annexing Texas. But a lot more people, even many Northerners, like the idea of gaining more land. This idea of manifest destiny is gaining momentum. In fact, Henry Clay is going to dance around the issue of, of whether or not to annex Texas because he doesn't want to upset the North or the South, and he ends up losing votes from both of them, and that's what cost him the election. Polk is also going to go further. He's going to say not only are we going to get Texas, but we're going to get another uh, section of Mexico, California, which would be on the West Coast in this area, he says, we're going to get California. One way or another, we're going to get California. Now, ultimately, uh, or, or at first, his plan was to buy California from Mexico. But Mexico is not going to like Polk too much. So eventually, Polk's going to basically engineer a war. And then when we have that war with Mexico, we, we force them to give us California. He also decides to address this part of the map that I'm circling here. He says that Oregon country that we were sharing with England, we're not going to share it with England anymore. And uh, so he says, we're not going to share it. We're going to have that land too. Now, he never said the slogan himself, but uh, his supporters did say this. Well, he might have said it. I'm not sure, but it was not officially part of his campaign. But his supporters definitely said this phrase. They went around saying 54-40 or fight. They basically were saying, we want Oregon country all the way up to the 54-40 line, which was the top of the Oregon country. Uh, it's a lot, line of latitude. And... Uh, Basically, they'll back off of that, but, but at the time that he's getting elected, his, his supporters are saying, we're going to take the entire Oregon country. Uh, we'll, what will end up happening, I'll talk about uh, shortly. Okay, so Polk, no-nonsense guy, very not on the fence, very pro-expansion, take Texas, take California, take Oregon. Uh, basically, let's expand our country all the way to the Pacific Coast. Uh, he's going to get elected and get elected fairly easily. If you look at the electoral vote, uh, you can see that he wins over 60% of the electoral vote, which would be considered a landslide. Interesting to note that he doesn't win his home state. I'm not sure about how that happened. But anyway, overall, he's going to do very well in this election. And so basically, whenever he goes around saying, hey, you vote for me and we're going to expand our country, and then he wins by so much, uh, he's going to say, this is a mandate from the American people. They must want this country to expand. And so what Polk is going to do is he's going to set all his energy towards expanding the country westward. If you look as a side note, you'll see that there is a small third party that runs during this election known as the Liberty Party. These were people that were against slavery. Uh, these would be your abolitionists. Uh, Frederick Douglass would have been one of these uh, people. And actually, the Liberty Party pulled just enough votes away from Henry Clay in New York City, or excuse me, in New York, to give New York to Polk. And if you were to do the math, if Polk had lost New York, he would have lost the election. So this third party, this little abolitionist party, actually cost Henry Clay the election and gave it to the expansion president, Polk. And here we are, ready to start expanding. So let's talk about Texas first. So after Polk was elected, the United States is going to annex Texas. In fact, it was so popular that they actually annexed Texas the couple days before he became president. Uh, so John Tyler, the president before him, technically gets credit uh, for the annexation of Texas as a new territory that would become a state. Uh, but it was really Polk that made the idea popular. So Polk ultimately deserves the most credit for getting uh, Texas. The problem, though is that this is going to make a lot of people angry both in our country and in Mexico. Let's talk about the people in this country first. Uh, so people in the United States are going to be upset with the annexation of Texas because they are going to say when Texas becomes a state, it's going to be a slaveholding state, it's going to give the South more power in Congress, and there was actually talk of taking Texas and carving up the territory into as many as five different states, which would really bolster the slaveholding states' power in Congress and in the Senate. But there's going to be another country that's, or another group that's going to be upset also, and we'll talk about that more before we get, and then we'll eventually come back to the abolitionists. Let's talk about Mexico. 
Remember, Mexico felt like Texas had been taken from them. Remember that Santa Ana had been forced at gunpoint to give Texas its independence. And so Mexico is going to be very upset because they felt like Texas was never really legitimately independent, and now they've become part of the United States. So in a sense, they say that the United States stole Texas. And you have to remember that a lot of the people that had fought for the independence of Texas had come from the United States. So this really ups the tension uh, with Mexico. And eventually it's going to help cause the Mexican-American War. I'm going to come back to that shortly. I'll talk about Oregon first. One other thing to note is that one of the other sources of tension between Mexico and the United States is not just the fact that the United States took Texas, but the question is, where's the border? And if you look at the map here, this section here, both the United States and Mexico will claim to be theirs. The United States will claim that to be part of Texas, and Mexico will say that this is part of Mexico. But let me talk about Oregon first, then we'll come back to the issue with Mexico and talk about the Mexican-American War. Okay, so if you look at this map here, you can see the Oregon country and how big it was. And you can see that it goes from the 42nd parallel, 42nd line of latitude, all the way up to the 5440 line. All the way up to what is now Alaska, pretty much, which was owned by Russia at the time. We'll buy Alaska from Russia after the Civil War. Okay, so... Lots of Polk supporters had gone around yelling out 5440 or fight, and this was a slogan that basically said that not only are we not going to share Oregon with England anymore, but we're going to own the whole thing all the way up to the 5440 line that you see here on the map. There's a problem, though, and that is that if we say to England, we're not sharing it, we're taking the whole thing, uh, it could cause a war with England. Now, we did have uh, some reason to claim Oregon as ours. It was beside our territory. A lot of it was. Of course, Britain still owned Canada, so they were beside Oregon as well. But remember, also, we had moved out there a lot with our overlanders. One of the most famous trails that brought people out west was the Oregon Trail. There were more Americans living in the Oregon country than there were uh, people from England. Uh, we had mapped out the area more, so we felt like we deserved to have it, and we felt like we deserved to have the whole thing. The problem is, is that if we want to claim the whole thing, we might have a war with England, and Polk did not want that. Polk was already aware that Mexico was angry about our annexing of Texas, and he said to himself, we can't afford a war or we can't win a war with both Mexico and England. So uh, Polk is going to decide that he's going to have to compromise with one of the two countries. And what he ends up doing is he compromises with uh, England, and he says, how about we split the land? And that's the, ultimately what happens is Congress is going to create a treaty, the Oregon Treaty, which basically splits the Oregon country in half. The northern half ends up becoming British Columbia, which is part of Canada today. That's above the 49th parallel. And the land below becomes parts of Oregon and Washington and Idaho that we have today. So in the end, we don't take all of Oregon, but we do take basically half of it. If you look at the map, you can see we actually get a little bit more than half. Uh, and so we do get a lot of land here, but Polk was willing to compromise on this land. So what are going to be the consequences of this? Well, the good consequence is that we don't have a war with England. We have, we have two wars with England in American history, uh, the American Revolution, if you will, and then the, uh, the War of 1812. Uh, we won't have any more. In fact, in the future, in American II, you'll see that we'll side with England in World War I and in World War II. So, tension with England goes down, we don't have a war with England, and now Polk can really set his energy on Mexico, and we're getting we're gearing up for the Mexican-American War. In fact, this treaty gets signed the same year that, that we uh, declare war on Mexico. Who in the United States is going to be unhappy about this? It's going to be your northerners. The northerners are going to be upset because they're going to say that we could have had a lot of future free states come out of this land. Uh, this land was not very conducive to uh, growing cotton. It's A lot of it's very wet. It rains a lot. And uh, a lot of northerners had anticipated that if Texas came in and created a lot of southern slave states, then Oregon country could come in and create a lot of uh, free states. And Northerners are going to be upset with Polk because he's willing to compromise on land that could become future free states, but he's not going to be so willing to compromise when it comes to Texas, which is going to be a slave state in the near future. 
So Northerners aren't too happy with Polk on this decision, but he does it anyway. Now let's get to the causes of the Mexican-American War itself, or sometimes just called the Mexican War for short. Uh, so if you look at the middle oval, the theme of this little chart here will be causes of the Mexican-American War. So in the middle oval, again, write causes of the Mexican-American War. And I'm going to go through three of them. The first cause I've already talked about. And, and uh, that is the annexation of Texas. So cause number one is the annexation of Texas. Uh, Mexico had never fully recognized Texas's independence. Santa Ana, again, had gone back to Mexico City saying they forced me at gunpoint to sign this declaration or this independence document they had, and it was not a legitimate document. Mexico City never really fully recognized Texas independence, uh, the capital. Uh, Mexico City never really recognized Texas independence, and so a lot of Mexicans were angry because they basically felt like the United States had stolen Texas from them. Americans had moved into Texas and basically taken it over. Americans had gone and fought to help, uh, not the U.S. government, but American citizens had gone and helped to fight for independence for Texas, and now finally swoops in the U.S. government and they annex Texas. So Mexicans really probably saw this as a long, ongoing conspiracy of the United States to take land from them. Another cause of the Mexican-American War will be the American desire for California. California is on the West Coast. Uh, California has a lot of good farmland. People don't realize that, but it is very good for farming. There are lots of vineyards there today, lots of orchards there today. The dairy industry is huge in California, and it's also on the Pacific Coast. And if it's on the Pacific Coast, that gets the United States one step closer to being able to trade with countries on the other side of the Pacific, like China and India. Remember this desire to find a Northwest Passage uh, and, and trade with India and, and China. Well, acquiring California would get us closer. Uh, Polk had also wanted to get New Mexico, which was basically the land between Texas and California. That was not as high a priority as California, but that was something else that he wanted. In short, what Polk wants is he wants the northern half of Mexico, and he's already ticked off Mexico by, by tearing away the Texas part. And eventually he's going to tear away the rest of northern Mexico from Mexico uh, as a result of the war, which we'll get to uh, in a little bit. So when Polk offers Mexico money for California and New Mexico, and he offers a good bit of money, Mexico will not even talk to his representatives that he sends to Mexico. They won't even meet with his representatives because they're so angry about Texas. So, cause number one, we take Texas, which was technically independent, although Mexico disputed that. Number two is we wanted California, and Mexico was so mad over Texas that they wouldn't even talk about it. That doesn't mean Polk's going to give up on California, by the way. It just means he's going to find another way to get California besides buying it. What's his other way going to be? Making a war with Mexico. We'll talk about how he, uh, in kind of shady, in a kind of shady way, engineers this war. More on that later. And he's really going to capitalize on cause number three of the war. Okay, so again, annexing Texas causes tension. Our desire for California and Mexico's uh, desire to keep California will cause tension. And finally, the border dispute. So remember that there was a border dispute. This territory that I'm showing here in the map here with the mouse, this area of land, uh, both the United States and Mexico is going to claim. Mexico is going to say that the border starts here at the Nueces River. Mexico, or excuse me, yeah, uh, Mexico is going to say that the border starts at the Nueces River. The United States is going to say that it starts at the Rio Grande. If you know your geography, you know who ends up winning this argument. I've actually been to the Rio Grande. It's actually a very tiny river. It's uh, as small as many creeks in North Carolina are. It's not a very big river, but it was a, a border. It does serve as a border. Okay, so uh, back to the subject at hand. So there is going to be a border dispute. Both the United States and Mexico are going to be claiming this land that's basically between the Nueces and the Rio Grande. 
And Polk realizes this. He realizes that this is a source of tension, and he's basically going to find a way to use this tension to get Mexico to fire upon American troops and thus start a war. And we can say that they started the war and that we were just defending ourselves. Of course, that is disputed. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But just remember that the breaking point of tension between the United States and Mexico is going to be uh, this disputed territory that's shown here on the map in the middle. So how does the war start? Uh, go, if you will, if you're looking at your notes, go to the box that says War Ignites. We'll start there, and then we'll get into uh, how people felt about the Mexican-American War in the United States. So go to the box that says War Ignites first. Okay, so what Polk is going to do is he is going to deliberately march troops, American troops, into this disputed territory. Knowing that this is going to anger the Mexican government, knowing that this might prompt Mexican troops to attack American troops. And that's exactly what happens. So the, um, the Mexican army, which was also in the area and also claiming that land, is going to attack and kill 11 soldiers uh, of the United States. And when this happens, a lot of Americans are going to be angry. Remember that Manifest Destiny was an idea in a lot of people's heads. And a lot of people said to themselves that this land belongs to us. God has ordained that we're supposed to have this land. Polk was elected president so that we could have land such as this. And so this is really going to rile up the American people, especially when Polk goes and he makes, I believe, a speech where he says that American blood has been shed on American soil. So he's basically going to claim that Mexico has gone into American territory and killed Americans, and therefore war with Mexico is justified. Now when Polk says this, it's a half-truth, because the land where this happened, allegedly happened, it's going to be on, uh, it's in land that's disputed. It was not clear that it was actually American land. It was also being claimed by Mexico at the time. But Polk's going to be very bold, and he's going to say, nope, this is our land, and our blood has been shed on our own land. Therefore, war with Mexico is going to be uh, justified. Now, what's interesting is that whenever discussions of this war uh, come about, uh, there's going to be a congressman from Illinois who is going to say to himself, I don't know if I believe this story. I don't know if this story is accurate or if it's true. Polk might be lying. Did this even really happen? If it did happen, where did it really happen? And he is going to ask the people of Congress, and ask. he's going to ask them to bring out a map and to, quote, point out the spot where this happened. The people in Congress were already riled up and ready for war. They laugh at this guy for asking to point out where the spot was. He ends up not even get, getting reelected to Congress, largely as a result of this. This man's name was Abraham Lincoln. And he get, earns the nickname at this point of Spotty Lincoln for questioning the events that led to the Mexican-American War. He smelled a rat, basically. But most people laughed at him for smelling this rat, and in the end, Congress is going to declare war on Mexico. And basically, Lincoln is going to get uh, out of office within a couple years, and he's going to go back home to Illinois, and he's going to be a failure at uh, trying to get reelected to future positions until he becomes president of the United States. And we all know that he was the president during the Civil War, and uh, he is one of the most impactful presidents, if not the most impactful president in American history. So more about Lincoln later on. At this point, though, we have declared war on Mexico, and it is not a war that everyone in this country agrees upon. People like Frederick Douglass oppose this war. Abolitionists oppose this war in general. Uh, a lot of Northerners did, but especially abolitionists. They oppose this war because they said all this is is a war to get more land that's going to end up becoming future slave states. And again, one of the leading voices to oppose uh, the Mexican-American War as a conspiracy to expand slavery is going to be Frederick Douglass. Now keep in mind that the Missouri Compromise line did not extend into this land that we're about to get from Mexico, but there were some Southerners that kind of expected that it would. A lot of people kind of expected that it would, but technically it didn't. That's why we're going to need another compromise after the war's over. I'll talk more about that later. Now, remember that the Northerners, a lot of Northerners are opposed to this war, and there were more Northerners than Southerners. And so one man named David Wilmot's going to come along, and he's going to make a suggestion. He's going to say, okay, Texas, it's going to be a slave state. 
It already has slavery. Can't really get rid of slavery there. But with the rest of the land that we may win from Mexico, let's go ahead and say that we're going to make that free land. This was meant to appease people in the north, to make them more on board with the Mexican-American War. This would make abolitionists happy because then slavery would not expand. However, the Wilmot Proviso never passes in Congress. Why does it not pass? Because there were so many people in favor of slavery in Congress that it doesn't pass. The Senate blocks this from passing, uh, if I remember correctly, and so it doesn't pass. However, this doesn't make the issue go away. There will continue to be people that are going to be opposed to the expansion of slavery in the West. People like uh, Frederick Douglass, eventually people like Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and so what ends up happening is that even though this proposal to make all this new Western land become free, even though that proposal is defeated, what this does is it leads to the birth of a new political party known as the Free Soil Party. We'll talk about the Free Soil Party later. They are basically, that party is the father of the modern Republican Party in some ways. Uh, uh, and uh, that party, its main platform, among other things, but its main platform was to prevent the expansion of slavery to the West. It was not an abolitionist party. It did not oppose slavery everywhere, but it did oppose slavery expanding further west of Texas. And why does the Free Soil Party get created? It gets created because the Wilmot Proviso uh, was defeated in Congress. So all the people that supported the Wilmot Proviso that wanted to make this new land free, they end up joining up together and creating the Free Soil Party. More on that later on. Okay, now let's talk about the war itself. And if you are into the war uh, stuff, if you're into war history, unfortunately, this one's not a very long war. It doesn't take very long to talk about. If you're into war history, wait for the Civil War. That's when I'm going to get much more in detail. So basically, there are four parts to this war, main parts to this war. And if you look at the map, you can see that I have the map labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. And the boxes on the left-hand side, part 1, 2, 3, and 4, correspond to those numbers. So basically, where the number is labeled on the map, that's the location of the events that I'm talking about. So part 1, let's talk about Santa Fe, which would be about, well, you can see it here on the map. It would be right here. And, of course, you can see about where it would be on your note sheet as well. So why do we go after Santa Fe, which is uh, the capital of New Mexico today, a major city? We go after Santa Fe because basically any trade that happened in the northern part of Mexico happened, uh, it went through Santa Fe. And so if we could take over Santa Fe, we could basically economically cut off much of northern Mexico. So again, Santa Fe was a major trade center for northern Mexico, and whenever we cut off uh, whenever we took over Santa Fe, we're basically cutting off northern Mexico from the southern part of Mexico, cutting it off from its capital, Mexico City. That's an important thing to note. Uh, whenever you fight a war, one way to win a war is not just winning battles. The American Revolution should have taught you that already. One other way to win a war is to win the economic battles. If you can make the other country hurt enough economically, you can make that country surrender. In fact, the American Civil War was largely won not because of battles, but because the, North, the southern economy was so badly hurt by the northern military strategy. So keep in mind that winning wars is not just winning battles, it's also having an economic impact on the country you're fighting against. And if you can ruin the economy of the country you're fighting against, you can get them to surrender. Uh, and basically taking over Santa Fe was a step in that direction. Part two, capture California. Well, it just so happened that California was also fighting for independence uh, from Mexico. Uh, or a lot of people there were trying to become independent, and we decided to conveniently help them out. There was a revolt going on in California known as the Bear Flag Revolt. Uh, and you can see the flag that represented the California Republic, which was a very uh, short-lasting republic because it soon becomes part of the United States. Uh, after the Mexican-American War concludes. But basically, California is going to pull a Texas, and they're going to get, try to get independence from, their, from uh, Mexico, and we conveniently help them out in doing so. So our troops, some of our troops are going to be sent there 
and you can see where some of our troops traveled. Some of them actually had gone to Santa Fe and then went on to California to help out in the Bear Flag Revolt, and they helped free California. And if you look at the flag of California today, you'll see that the flag still has a bear on it, and that is uh, traced back to the Bear Flag Revolt in the 1840s. Uh, if you're wanting a date for this war, this war goes from 1846 to 1848. So about a year and a half is how long this war takes. Okay, so after losing Santa Fe, actually let me rewind. Mexico had already lost Texas. They were losing the disputed territory that they had claimed. Now they've lost Santa Fe. Now they've lost California. So after parts one and two of our military strategy, we've basically taken over the entire northern half of Mexico. And this was not all that difficult to do, to be honest. Santa Fe went, I don't even know if anyone died in Santa Fe. It, very, it was very easy for us, relatively speaking, for us to win the northern half of Mexico. Part of the reason for that is because most of the Mexican population was further south, around Mexico City. So we were basically taking over an area that was not very well populated. Uh, in fact, most of this area is desert. And so there weren't that many people there. In fact, one of the biggest populations would have been the Mormon population, which would have been somewhere, if you look at where I'm pointing, somewhere around here. But at this point, Mexico has lost control of its northern half. They're not doing too well. So the next question is, how do we get them to surrender? And ultimately, that strategy is going to be to capture their government in Mexico City. But first, we have to make sure that we are able to capture their government in Mexico City. Mexico City was very well guarded. Uh, there were lots of soldiers that would have been there to prevent it from being captured. So we're going to have to find a way to get those troops out of Mexico City. So what do we do? Part three, we invade from the north. We deliberately, at this point, cross over the Rio Grande. We start to deliberately invade Mexican land. This isn't even disputed territory that I'm pointing at with a mouse. But we deliberately invade the northern uh or we del deliberately invade uh, Mexico, north of Mexico City. And we start marching our troops towards Mexico City. Now, Me the government in Mexico City was not dumb. They did not want to just wait for our troops to get to Mexico City because Mexico City could possibly be destroyed. So what they end up doing is they end up sending troops out of Mexico City northward to intercept our troops and uh, therefore in their minds, protect Mexico City and keep the, keep the war away from the majority of Mexican citizens. So they meet us uh, at Buena Vista. You can see it pointed at here on the map about Buena Vista, which we win. Uh, however, uh, the battle takes place pretty far away from Mexico City. So to the Mexican government, this was a good idea because, again, it kept the war away from the main population of Mexico. It kept it more in the desert area of Mexico. The problem, though, is that when the troops left Mexico City to go intercept our troops, Mexico City is largely left unguarded. So what does the United States do? You can see it on the map right here. Look at New Orleans and look at what happens. General Winfield Scott's about to flank Mexico City and that will be part four. So part four is capture Mexico City itself. So General Winfield Scott, he's going to leave from New Orleans. He's going to take his troops through the Gulf of Mexico. They're eventually going to land at Veracruz, and then they're going to march their way to Mexico City. And when they get to Mexico City, they are going to fairly quickly capture uh, the city. They capture it after only a couple days worth of fighting, which is a pretty quick uh, victory when you're talking about the capital of a country. And so they're going to capture uh, Mexico City. They're going to capture the government. The government's already lost control of its northern half. And at this point, it has no real choice but to surrender. And so, at this point, the Mexican-American War is going to come to a close. Uh, the war is not over yet, though, until there's a treaty. Remember that wars don't officially end unless there's a treaty. So let's get to the treaty. And the treaty is known as the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And in this treaty, Mexico basically gives, or well, doesn't give, uh, sells to us all the land that Polk had promised that he would get. So Polk is a rare politician in that he made bold promises and he pretty much kept them all. So if you look at this map here of the modern United States, everything that's in white 
That is land that was gotten from Mexico. We did have to pay for it. We had to pay, I think, $15 million. So think of it like another Louisiana purchase. But we did still get what we wanted. Even if we had to pay for it, we got what we wanted. And then you could say that uh, Mexico got a consolation prize, $15 million. Notice where the border is. The border is where we said it would be. And at this point, we have all of the lower 48, or what would become the lower 48 states, all the land, all the way to the Pacific Ocean that we have today, except for this little piece of land here. Uh, that's the Gadsden Purchase piece of land. I'll talk about that in a later lecture. But everything that's in white, that is what we force Mexico to sell to us. Now, some people ask, why didn't we take more? Why didn't we take land all the way down to Mexico City? And the reason that I think it is, well, there's two main reasons. Uh, one reason is that uh, northern citizens would have been very upset about this because they would say that's even more land that could pot potentially become slave land. And so I think the fact that we kept the border where it was was a compromise between the northern states and the southern states. But another practical reason why we didn't go for more land is that the further south you get, the more dense the Mexican population gets, and they don't want to be taken over. So had we tried to have taken all of Mexico, we would have had a major war, a major revolt of citizens on our hands that I don't think we could have handled. It's easy to take over this part of Mexico because there's not that many people there to resist us. There will be millions upon millions of people further south to resist us. So the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, what it is, is the treaty that in which we win the war officially and Mexico sells us the states that are in, or the land that's in white here in the map. And that piece of land is known as the Mexican Cession. And that makes up the majority of what is now known as the American Southwest. So Mexico's not very happy with us, but we've beaten them in a war, so there's not much that they can do about it. But that does not remove the issue of of uh, tension within our country. There's still a question of what do we do with this land, this land that, that's shown in white here. Do we make this slaveholding land? Do we make this free land? Do we split it down the middle? Uh, and the North and the South is going to fight over this and ultimately uh, we're going to come up with a compromise. Henry Clay is going to come up with a compromise of 1850 to settle the dispute over what to do with this land and ultimately uh, the compromising isn't going to work out. Ultimately, we are going to be on the road to civil war, largely over the issue of slavery in the West, especially because literally a couple weeks after we get this land, gold is found in California, and the northern states and the southern states are going to argue over whether or not, well, let me rewind, gold is going to be found in California, the California gold rush is going to occur, California is going to be ready to become a state, and the northern states and the southern states are going to fight over whether or not California can come in. And if it's going to come in, if it's going to come in as a free state or a slave state, somewhere in between, uh, and that, will, again, will set us on the road towards civil war. More on those details in later lectures.